talk for me real quick. Test one, two, test. This is my voice. I don't know what the levels are on it. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, that's uh, great. Okay, cool. so. Um, I, mean, I lost it because I'm going to get some help. There we go. I may have moved. All right. So where did you start? Like, uh, where, where are you from? I was born in New Jersey, but uh, moved out to L.A. when I was five years old. So I'm pretty much from Los Angeles. I've been here for a while. Nice. Uh, and, and did you go to school out there? Or? In Jersey? Yeah. No, because I was five, like, by the time I moved oh, to L.A. So I wait, was, how old were you when you moved to L.A.? I was five years old when I moved to L.A., oh, so wow. I've been here for the majority of my life. You're like an idiot. I wasn't even listening to you. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, and you... Uh, you your parents moved out here? Yeah, I moved out with uh, with my, my mom and dad. Uh, my dad was a screenwriter and uh, my mother uh, was a producer and uh, sort of just kept commuting from New Jersey to LA so much it just made sense to, to make the move. Oh, so. nice. Nice. And they discouraged me from getting involved with uh, anything <laughs> in the motion picture business <laughs> from experience. So. Of course, I started doing it anyway. And, uh, That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so stop motion wise, I mean, did you go to school and study stop motion, or? I did. Yeah, I went to uh, to Cal Arts, uh, actually in the uh, live action program. But I've always been interested in stop motion. I, I mean, my dad showed me uh, Mysterious Island when. I was a kid and I just thought it was the coolest thing and then I started watching all the other Harryhausen movies and then got into Wallace and Gromit and Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, everything in the 90s that was stop-mo related. Um, but it's all, I've always been interested in stop-motion and live-action and also incorporating the two. So I went into CalArts for live-action but then the first thing I started doing during class sign-ups when I was in school there was bugging uh, Stephen Kyoto because uh, he teaches there and uh, you know every semester I'd go and I'd say hey will you let me into your stop motion class this time and he said well you know you're in the live action program they don't really want to <laughs> do that I, it always fills up and finally I think after two or three semesters of really just harassing the man uh, he let me into his class and he was just like the coolest guy and I went over to his studio and uh, I started just working on uh, more and more stop motion and by the end of it I was hardly doing any live action at all um, and so yeah I just sort of kind of I was always interested in stop motion and was doing stuff on Super 8 and you know video cameras where you can only do 8 to 10 frame bursts if you're really fast on the record button and I was doing that as a kid but uh, then, in college, I just got more into it and started doing more of it, yeah. It's cool. So, has animation just become your life now? Uh, I mean, I, st it's, I still straddle animation and live action. Uh, I wouldn't even say animation, I'd say specifically stop motion. There's something about it. I mean, I'm interested in storytelling in general. I've worked as an animator. I've also worked as uh, just a freelance screenwriter. Um, it really depends on the story and what, whatever medium best tells the story I'm interested in. So it's, it's story first, whether it's live action or animation, but I definitely have a soft spot for stop motion. There's something about just the texture of it and the look, it's really unique. And even if I'm doing a live action project, I try to uh, sneak in a little stop mo. But, uh, this dog behind me. The rest of the project is live action, but I thought, oh, there's got to be a stop motion dog in it. Uh, so that's great. Yeah. Wow. So you you like the 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 melding of like the Ro who framed Roger Rabbit kind of style, or yeah, I mean Roger Rabbit's great. Or the and mascot, the I mean, old school. Yeah, like, yeah, Starovich. Um, yeah. I mean, Starovich was pushing that just with you know stuff like the cameraman's revenge, where the insect puppets are so realistic. I imagine you know people who hadn't necessarily been familiar with the technique at the time were just wondering how did he get those insects to do that and I'm interested in bending reality in that way with stop motion because people I think CG has gotten so good but you're never fooled into thinking it's not CG just because it has that look to it but there's something about 
a real textured object under real light being shot in a real space and especially now with uh, frame grabbers and video playback you can get so precise with your animation like I think there are areas of stop motion yet to be explored and a whole new generation of people to uh, sort of fall in love with the technique uh, it's I guess I guess it's seeing a little bit of a comeback at least right now which I think is awesome uh, what are you what are you doing now besides that uh, the dog you're doing like commercials and stuff and yeah the dog is for a uh, uh, a web series that uh, I'm, I've written and I'm co-directing with a friend of mine, uh, which is predominantly live action, but has stop motion and some other effects in it. Uh, it's called Project 420, and it's, uh, it's about uh, government scientists who uh, study narcotics. It's kind of a black comedy. Uh, I'm also freelancing uh, as an animator and as an animation director. I recently just shot uh, these four spots with uh, with Shadow Machine, uh, and I don't think I can talk about those yet. Uh, although by the time this would be edited, it will have been out for months. <laughs> uh, um, Animation-wise, like uh, you love you love the the composite live action and stop motion. I mean, yeah, I mean that goes back just to. You know, Harryhausen's stuff being the first stuff that I saw, was, and stop motion was this fantastical element that was injected into something that otherwise makes sense visually, and uh, I thought, you know, wow, how'd they do that? I, you know, what, how did they get a 50-foot cyclops there on the beach with all these people running around? And, yeah. But, uh, I mean, I'm interested in, you know, pure stop motion, too. I love just everything in miniature. When the when the sets are art directed and the production design. Totally. So did you did you build your sets for the Bygone Behemoth? For Bygone Behemoth, yeah, yeah, yeah. I built the sets uh, just out of anything I could find. I built flats out of MDF and then uh, hand painted all the wallpaper and did the uh, did the wainscoting and stained that. And I mean, I ended up sort of doing everything. It, it, it was a learning experience because I think in a way with a lot of the stuff on set I over rendered it I put too much time into something that was going to be tucked away in the corner in shadow but like the chair that he's sitting in I actually upholstered in vinyl um, sort of the way you would a real chair uh, I, I mean I used glue to hold it together but it's a wood block with foam and then vinyl over that and then after I did it I thought you yeah, know I really could have cut this whole thing out of could have carved it out of, uh, you know, hard foam or something like that, but, because, uh, uh, yeah. I think it looks awesome, actually. Yeah. I, I don't, oh, yeah, the chair's right there. I, I think you, I think you needed I it. I mean, that's, that's the thing. I didn't even know, like, stuff like that was out there pre-made. With Behemoth, I wanted everything to have a very specific texture and sort of that 1950s design, because he's stuck in that time, so I was looking at, you know, reference photos of chairs by Eames and different wallpaper like the wallpaper I was I was looking for wallpaper for his apartment I couldn't really find anything I liked and then I was watching an old episode of uh, uh, The High Mooners with Jackie Gleason and when you go into the Norton's apartment they have this really ugly floral wallpaper and I was watching it and then just went bam that's oh, it wow. and I couldn't find it so I made a uh, I took some acetate and sort of had the reference from the Honeymooners playing and I drew the wallpaper and then traced it onto the acetate and cut out a stencil and ended up paint, uh, sponging in the wallpaper with this acetate uh, stencil. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Which, I mean, it was a lot of fun. Look, looking back on it, it was fun at the time. I think it was kind of masochistic. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you think it needed to be done, though? You had to do it that way? I don't know if I had to do it that way. I'm, I'm happy I did do it that way. If I was doing it again, I may have done it differently. But uh, Because, you know, I'd animated before and I'd built puppets before, but this was really the first project that I was sort of doing everything myself, uh, from, you know, design to building to shooting, lighting, everything. Like, And it was it was nice because I had the luxury of time to do that. Like, I was able to take nine months and sort of make my mistakes and figure out um, what I was doing as I went along, but if I did it again, I'd definitely try to streamline the process a little bit more. Why, why did you make the film? 
Why would I make the phone? Um, like what was what was, the, what was the whole idea? I mean, you working in a medium and you like live action stop motion, so it's like it, that's a purely stop motion film, except for a, a couple live action mixed in sequences. Yeah. You know? I mean, I mean, like I said, I want any any whatever medium tells the story. Um, I wanted to. I mean, I wanted to make a film. I decided I wanted to make a stop motion film. I had done a couple of live action projects and. I'd been rewatching a lot of my favorite uh, stop motion movies, and I thought I want to get back into this, but I wanted to make something that I felt needed stop motion to exist, like something that was thematically about stop motion. I thought, okay, well, how how can I how can I make something that's sort of meta and self-referential without being too crazy? And I thought, okay, well. Stop motion's in a renaissance now, but ten years ago it wasn't. And I knew a lot of. I had a lot of animator friends. Uh, uh, I have a friend named Robert who was. He lives in New York, and he was a family friend all through growing up. And he sort of mentored me and watched me as I was, you know, making my artwork. He was, and he's an old school animator from way way back. He did the uh, he did the Refrigerator People on Pee Wee's Playhouse and like tons of commercials and I remember just talking to him in the early 90s when CG was really becoming the predominant art form for special effects and stop motion was no longer being used for anything that wasn't super stylized and it was getting really difficult to find work and I was remembering that and thinking okay well what if that what if the puppet instead of the animator was personified as being out of work and I thought well that's kind of interesting and I could do it as sort of a tribute to Harryhausen and Willis O'Brien and shoot it in black and white and do all this uh, noir lighting and 50s production design and uh, that's just an aesthetic I'm really interested in I love uh, I love film noir uh, live action as well as animated <laughs> and I don't I don't really remember how it originated how how all those different things sort of coalesced into one. I just know I was watching a lot of old movies, both classic noir and animation, and thinking that I wanted to make something that just thematically needed to be stop motion, and then all those pieces just sort of fell together, and I wrote the script and took it through several drafts, and, and thought, okay, well, now I'm going to spend five months making everything, and... Uh, shoot the damn thing wow that's awesome yeah it was a lot of fun it took you five months to shoot it no it took me all told from sort of its initial conception to locking picture and doing the sound mix i think it was about nine or ten months uh the shooting went relatively quickly um this first couple months i just spent with the idea of writing the script and doing concept drawings and that kind of thing uh and then there was about five months of fabricating everything, building all the sets, and uh, working on the puppet. Uh, he's got a very nice uh, machined uh, ball socket armature that uh, a man named John Dial uh, made for me, uh, based on my designs, and uh, it's five or six months of that. And then the shooting went relatively quickly. I think it was about three, three and a half weeks. Because what I did was I shot the whole thing in live action with myself just acting out all the beats to, I'll be honest, I hate storyboarding and I needed some kind of animatic as a guide. So I shot everything and just sort of cut that live action video to music and that was how I was able to figure out what the shots were going to be and uh, then just started shooting them and plugging them into that. And, uh, so that went relatively quickly. Once once everything was built, I knew exactly what I wanted to shoot and how long each of the shots were going to be. And You know, there's still stuff that moves around if an idea occurs due to performance changes, but uh, yeah, the shooting was pretty pretty quick. So do you love stop motion? I mean, do you have a love for it? Oh, definitely, yeah. I, I love stop motion. Yeah. I can't... It, it's, it's hard to say why you love something, but, uh, you know, like you said, part of it may be just through through my father and through Robert and just being exposed to that from a young age, but also just, and there's, some, there's something magical about it. There's, it, it doesn't, unless you, th there's something inherently eye-catching about it. 
and until you sort of grow up and learn that film is lots of pictures strung together, you know, 24 frames a second or whatever, it just jumps out because it's something that shouldn't exist in the world, but it does. And you know, I, I, it's sort of the way Harryhausen has uh, not made an excuse for, but justified the fact that his creations are stylized. He said, yeah, you know, you don't want it to look totally real. You want it to have this fantastical element, whether it's through the color or through the motion. And there's, there's just something about it that, uh, that draws me to it visually and resonates somewhere deeper. Do you think it's, it's difficult to know where to draw the line? I think if you're photographing something three-dimensional, that you're manipulating with your hands. I'd say that's stop motion because, you know, you look at the stuff that George Powell was doing, that's all replacement, but it's still has that, you know, if I, if you don't want to intellectualize it too much, you're just watching it, I still get the same warm, fuzzy gut reaction watching George Powell's puppetoons as I do watching more traditional, more traditionally defined stop motion animation. Mm. When you get into pixelation and total replacement animation and, you know, 2D cutouts, I think the definition gets a little dodgy, but ultimately it comes down to, do you like it and is it the right medium to tell the story? And uh, if it's that, then I don't care what it is. Well, that's one of, like you said, that's one of the cool things about stop motion is you sort of have to, if you want to do it yourself, in kind of an underground way without you know a giant budget and a huge crew of people you have to be able to do a little bit of everything you have to be something of an engineer to uh, build the armatures you have to know how to sew you have to know how to sculpt you have to know how to paint and you don't necessarily have to be an expert at all of them but you need to be familiar enough with the materials um, and there's something that's kind of cool about that whereas with CG or drawn there's, there's definitely an artistry to it, but it's more focused, and you end up sitting at a desk all day, which I think is why I never got into those. I like stop motion because you're constantly stimulating different parts of your creative brain, whether you're building the set or working with the camera or the puppet and jumping around between, between everything. Mm -hmm. It's it nice, though, because as kind of big and intense as you can get with it, it's still something that... I can't conceive of very many things in stop motion that you couldn't do inside a garage. Like, it's nice because in that way it's accessible. If you have the time and the energy and are crazy enough to attempt it, you can pretty much realize anything in miniature. And yeah. Don't need to call on a huge amount of people or a huge amount of money in order to do it. And I think that's awesome that more and more people have these garage setups, however elaborate or simple they are. And, uh, I know I, I, I have a few friends from CalArts, uh, well, they went to CalArts, they're, they're long since gone, but it's these four guys and they're all stop motion animators and they live in this house in Echo Park and their whole basement is just gutted and turned into a studio and that's where they all do their freelance work from. Like, that's that's the funny thing, like, I think that's very much kind of the animator personality, which I love and I'm also guilty of. You get a bunch of animators in a room, like if they've all been friends for a while, it's just like anybody else, but it's there's there's that certain mentality that you need to be able to sit alone for hours and hours and hours and push puppets and you get a bunch of them together and everybody's just kinda like <laughs> Hey, what's up? Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, um so do you have fun when you animate or does it get tedious and boring? <laughs> it depends what I'm working on. Um, for the most part, it's fun. I, uh, if it's going, it's it's fun if it's going well. I mean, there's always the shot where you kick the tripod or bump a light, and you've been working on it for three days, and then you'll just, if you're three miles away, you'll still be able to hear me yelling expletives at the top of my lungs. But uh, if it's going well and the performance is working, it's a very meditative thing. Like I'm not I'm not really a spiritual person, but I'm definitely high strung and get stressed out, but when I'm animating time just slows and you get into that rhythm and uh it's 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 a pleasant experience. It's great. 
unless you've got six puppets way at the back of the set and you're doing crazy yoga moves to, <laughs> to move them. What's the biggest yeah. set you've animated on? Biggest set? Hmm. Probably there was a there was a big laboratory set that was probably about I mean, nothing crazy huge. I didn't work on uh, Coraline or Nightmare or any of the really big sets that you actually walk into. The biggest set I've worked on was probably a tabletop that was 12 or 14 feet. Um, Frankenhole? Yeah, yeah. So one of the a couple of the sets for Behemoth were very deep. Um, deep and narrow because he's in this claustrophobic space so you know the walls themselves might have been six or seven feet and you have to go all the way to the back but in terms of overall space uh, nothing nothing too crazy nothing I was climbing in and walking around no, no. why did you choose why do you choose to do build up puppets uh, it depends on the puppet I mean I've done I've done cast puppets I've done cast puppets too um for the case of something like uh, the squid or the dog, they're built up because they're playing for a two to five second shot and it's like a one gag thing and just faster and cheaper to do that. For uh, for the dinosaur in Behemoth, his name is Al, by the way. Yeah. No, nobody knows that, his name is Al. Uh, <laughs> I did build up for several reasons. One was just that I wanted to do it kind of the traditional way that, you know, Marcel Delgado built up Kong and, like, so many of the classic stop-motion monsters were done that way and I wanted the, to feel like that. The other reason was just that, um, if I... He's, he's an elderly dinosaur, and if I cast it, I wanted to be able to get sort of the organic wrinkling that happens when you have... when you have a latex skin I wanted to give him some extra, some extra latex in the neck so that when he bent his neck it would wrinkle and buckle and look organic like that. And if I'd done him in foam latex or silicone, it just wasn't, I wasn't going to get that. Really? Well, it's funny, the, the last shot uh -huh. where he's... He's dying. He's, he, yeah, I guess he's dead in the chair. Originally it was supposed to be a little more ambiguous. He has a, uh, he has a threaded breathing mechanism. There's a steel plate that goes in and out and you turn it through uh, his back with uh, with an allen key but I got I had him in the chair he's all tied down the shots lit it was a this uh, motion control move where it pulls out I programmed the move I got ready to do the shot I think I got about a second and a half into it and I'm turning the allen key to make him breathe and I just hear a spring go ding I'm like oh there's the breathing mechanism it's not gonna work I yeah. guess I guess I have my ending, and I guess he's definitively dead. <laughs> yeah, so, wow. Um, that, that, I guess it worked out, but it's a little more of a outright depressing ending than I originally intended. Are you planning on doing like uh, another big big uh, stop metal short? I'd like to. Yeah, I. Uh, I'm about a short. I'm in talks with uh, a friend of mine and a couple other people he knows. We're we're working on an idea, a pitch for a uh, stop motion animated uh, web series because um, I'm just finishing up this live action web series and I think the web is just a great medium to get short form content out there and stop motion is something that, like I said, is localized and cheap enough that once you have the set and the puppets you could do a whole bunch of episodes. So I'm interested in doing not necessarily a short right now, but a series of shorts where I could develop a few characters over a length of time. Uh, and I'm also talking to a couple other people about uh, some stop motion music videos, which always end up playing out as a short anyway. So it's, you know, it's the same thing logistically, but it's got a song. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know, maybe uh, I'd, definitely, I'd definitely like to do another just straight up stop motion short in the near future. I don't. I, the the ideas I have right now are for these couple of music videos and for uh, for this web series. But I'm sure it won't be too long before something something happens. I hope. <laughs> but you had a huge response from the the movie. Yeah, it's been great. I never I never expected uh, really as many people to see it or like it or even hate it as much as uh, as much as I've gotten. 
I'm just I'm just happy people are watching it and hopefully they're getting a kick out of it. You got some negative press? Uh, not negative. I got a couple a couple of lukewarm, a couple of lukewarm reviews. Uh, one review called it uh, heavy-handed, and another one said that it wasn't particularly original, but you know it's not supposed to be original. It's 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 an homage and a callback to wow. everything that I. That got me into this mess to begin with. So. I think shooting on lots of stuff. The commercials we just shot were on the uh, on the 40D. Mm -hmm. um, this shot I borrowed a uh, a 5D. You know, I mean, it's great with software and computers now. You can what sort of plug using? in anything. You know, what are you using for for your frame crabbing? Uh, what am I using? It, cha it changes every changes. project. I, uh, nice. I've been working mostly on Dragon, but mm. I don't own Dragon. Uh, Behemoth I shot on Stop Motion Pro. Um, if I've got something short like this, I'll use uh, the last thing I shot. It was a very quick thing. I used a uh, what did I use? I used I Stop Motion uh, just sort of as a. Uh, I used iStop Motion as a lunchbox and was capturing high res frames just into the camera with a cable release. Nice. Um, so there's, it's always there's a little bit of uh, parallax to compensate for, mm -hmm. not quite seeing what you're actually seeing. But I mean, hell, when I started animating, there weren't digital cameras yet, so sometimes it's nice to turn off the frame grabber and the visual and just do it with surface gauges and old school. Nice. I like doing that. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, I had a, uh, I've, I've been fortunate, I've had a lot of really awesome teachers throughout growing up. And I had a fifth grade teacher who did this uh, filmmaking workshop with us. And he put me in touch with someone to get us a Super 8 camera from. It was this great, I still have it. It's a great little Super 8 camera and it had the ability to backwind so what I was able to do was I built this kind of rinky-dink matte box and I was trying to do the Harryhausen thing with stop motion and live action so I'd black out half the frame and shoot my live stuff and then backwind the camera, black out the other half so the other half was exposed and do the animation and you know that was film so then I would send it off and wait for three weeks for it to come back from Sweden and just that was the only place at the time that was developing Super 8 still and I just crossed my fingers and hope it was all in focus and, and uh, I remember I shot a whole stop motion project when I was a kid on Super 8 and the shutter was tweaked and so I got back the film and the whole thing was blown out and overexposed I was like oh well there's a week and a half's worth of work that's um, gone so digital is definitely nice in, in that respect I mean files still crash but you can see what you're doing while you're doing it, and that's very cool. Uh, I, I, I've always sort of straddled stop motion and live action, um, which in a way I like because it keeps it keeps everything fresh. I mean, like you said, being able to dance between CG and stop motion and videography just it keeps things fresh. And you know, as much as I love anything I'm doing, by the end of the project. I'll need to be doing something else for a little while before I go back to it. So I do stop motion and then I work in the stop motion industry. I guess yeah, stop motion is an industry. Um, I do work at that professionally at times. I'm also a, a screenwriter and I, I freelance as a, a screenwriter doing rewrites and that kind of thing as well. Um, which is, is nice because I can go from... They're, they're both very solitary though. Uh, whether, whether I'm sitting at a desk pounding lots of coffee and working on a script or sitting in a 12-foot box pounding lots of coffee and moving puppets. It's, it's six or one half dozen of the other. <laughs> your your uh, attention towards uh, film genres like uh, film noir and stuff, can you name some titles that you and some directors at all? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, my favorite director of all time, live action, stop motion, whatever, is probably Kubrick. Just I mean, when it comes down to it, like I said, I'm interested in whatever medium tells the story. And what I love about Kubrick is that he tackled all different genres, but 
had his own very distinct style and way of viewing the world, and whether he was making a horror movie or a romantic comedy or a thriller or what, it was so, so much him. Um, so I love, I love Kubrick just because of the themes that he deals with, you know, mankind's place in the universe and technology run amok and also his photography. I just, I love that symmetry and just everything he shot was so beautiful. Um, noir, I've been really into uh, Jacques Tourneau lately, uh, uh, stuff like Out of the Past with uh, Kirk Douglas and uh, Robert Mitchum and uh, even like, I, I, I love the art that uh, Turno brought to even like B-horror movies like Curse of the Cat People and I Walked with a Zombie, just there's some really, you know, there's silly B-movies but there's some really beautiful stuff in there in terms of just the moods he created and uh, where do you where do you think uh, this medium is going? Where stop motion is going? I mean, what do you think is next in terms of uh, production? Is it gonna get bigger? Or is it gonna get smaller? I don't know. I mean, it's pretty big right now, but I think everything goes in waves. Um, I don't know if stop mo I don't, and I, I can think of people on the boards of the stop mo of the stop motion site that'll uh, get mad at me for saying this. I don't think stop motion will necessarily get to a place that it's going to be used uh, for realistic visual effects again. Um, not because, it, you know, with frame grabbers and talented animators and fabricators, like, we're getting to a place that realistically you could buy it, but one of the things I love about stop motion is also one of the things that studios and producers hate, is that you can't revise it when it gets down to it. It's about the animator in the room with the puppet. It's not like CG where if three of the executives come in and say, yeah, we don't like the way that's going, you can revise and revise and revise. So I don't know that stop motion, just because of the expense and the luxury of that, will ever become really prevalent again in terms of the mainstream. Uh, I do think though that full stop motion movies music videos, TV shows, I think there's very much an appetite for that. I think people are getting burnt out on on the same, on just the CG aesthetic. Um, and, you know, there's there's quite a few stop motion features in development right now, and I think that will keep up at least at least for a while.